We're ready to pick back up in Chapter 23 and continue with our diseases of the cardiovascular and lymphatic system. Now we're going to move into viral diseases. Our first viral diseases belong to a group known as the hemorrhagic fevers. Hemorrhagic fevers are typically characterized by extremely high fevers and often uncontrolled bleeding in some sort of part, in some area of the body. The first hemorrhagic fever we'll discuss is called yellow fever. Yellow fever is a hemorrhagic fever that is transmitted by the mosquito Aedes aegypti. This is a mosquito that requires fairly high temperatures to complete its normal life cycles. Therefore, yellow fever is endemic in your tropical areas but much, and much less common in the areas that get cooler. This virus has a reservoir of a monkey. In order for transmission to occur to a human, the humans have to live in the areas that the monkey lives. The mosquito must bite the monkey that is carrying the virus and then bite a human. Once the human is bitten, the virus immediately moves through the entire body through the cardiovascular and lymphatic systems. It, this initiates a very high fever with chills. This is then going to be followed by nausea, vomiting, and eventual jaundice. Most people with yellow fever that die are going to die from liver failure before they die from the actual yellow fever. Yellow fever is a disease that has a fairly interesting history if you like those sorts of things. Yellow fever is what most of the scientists believe were, was the infection that killed most of the Native American Indians when the Europeans arrived. Another hemorrhagic fever is called dengue fever. It is also transmitted by a mosquito, but we are not 100% sure what the common reservoir for this hemorrhagic fever is. This disease is endemic in the Caribbean. Similar to yellow fever, once the mosquito transmits the virus from the reservoir to the human, the human immediately gets a fever, but instead of being followed by nausea and jaundice, now we're going to see the fever leading to extreme joint pain and a pretty nasty rash all over the body. The rash is actually not a raised rash that's itchy or anything like that. It's more of a dark red rash because of the heat in the body due to the high fever. Another hemorrhagic fever is called the Marburg virus. Marburg is very similar to yellow fever with a monkey reservoir and a mosquito vector. The symptoms and signs are also very similar, except this is the first one of the hemorrhagic fevers we're going to look at, that we see the sign of extremely profuse bleeding from all of the internal organs and the eyes. Ebola is more like Marburg, where you have an uncontrolled bleeding, but this virus has a much higher mortality rate. Ebola is transmitted by a mosquito as well, but it has a reservoir of a fruit bat. Now let's look at a couple protozoan diseases of these body systems. The first one to discuss is Chagas disease. We've talked about Chagas disease a little bit already this semester because Chagas disease is a infectious disease that is emerging in the United States, so it's becoming of much more interest to all of us. Chagas disease is also known as American trypanosomiasis. It is caused by a flagellated protozoan called Trypanosoma cruzii. Trypanosoma is extremely common in Central America and South America, but as temperatures are rising and immigration is rising, this protozoan is more likely to come into the United States. Trypanosoma cruzii is found in the reservoir rodent, possum, and armadillo. It is transmitted usually and most, com most commonly from a rodent by a bug called the kissing bug or triatome bug. This bug feeds from blood on the oral mucosa. While it's feeding off of blood, it typically defecates during its feeding process. Once this bug feeds off of a rodent that is infected and then moves and feeds off of a human, the human will then scratch their their, around their mouth or their eye, somehow they move that feces into their mouth or eye, and now that human is infected with the protozoan. 
Once the human is infected with the protozoan, they immediately begin to run a fever and all of the glands swell. This is going to be followed by paralysis of the esophagus and colon, and it can lead to coma and eventual death, but it's very treatable if you're in a place that they can get the medication to you. One of the hallmark signs of this disease is an extremely swollen abdomen due to all of the inflammation throughout the digestive system. Another protozoan disease of the cardio and lymphatic systems is toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is caused by the um, non-modal protozoan Toxoplasma gondii. This protozoan lives in the intestinal tract of cats. It is transmitted to humans one of two ways. It can either be inhaled from a cat litter box as the human fools with the cat litter and the feces float through the air, or it can be ingested if the cat litter or the cat feces is anywhere near um, the human's food. If an adult inhales or eats the Toxoplasma gondii, it's typically not going to be a problem. They may have some normal food poisoning side effects. Where this becomes a problem is if a very young child or a pregnant woman inhales the Toxoplasma gondii. In pregnant women, you can have stillbirth or extreme neurological birth defects observed in the child if the mother inhales this while pregnant. This is the number one reason that women are told not to have a cat in their house or fool with a cat litter box while they're pregnant. Another protozoan disease is malaria. Malaria is also caused by an AP complex and called Plasmodium vivax or Plasmodium falciparum. Either species of Plasmodium is going to be transmitted by a mosquito. Once the mosquito bites you, it puts the plasmodium into your blood. The plasmodium moves through your bloodstream and begins feeding on your red blood cells. Initially, you are going to have simple signs of inflammation, chills, fever, vomiting, severe headaches, and then you may not have any symptoms for quite a while. But the entire time, the protozoan has been moving through your blood, eating your red blood cells you're slowly going to become anemic until eventually your cardiovascular system collapses. This is a very interesting disease if you follow the life cycle of the plasmodium. When the mosquito bites you, he introduces a intermediate form of the plasmodium into your blood called a sporozoite. The sporozoite then moves to your liver and undergoes physogony. Recall from Chapter 12 that cytogony is a special type of asexual reproduction where one sporozoite goes into the liver, starts massively reproducing, and then the one cell erupts with hundreds of new plasmodiums called merozoites living the liver and going to eat red blood cells. They undergo cytogony again in the red blood cells until that red blood cell ruptures and releases more and more merozoites. Okay. Thought I had a picture. Guess not. There is a vaccination to help prevent malaria, and there is medication available that has a quinine in it. However, these medications are extremely painful, and the vaccination has quite a few side effects. So this is not something that you're going to take unless you're going to be going into an area that you have a high probability of getting the infection. There is no true prevention of malaria. You could still possibly get it even if you're vaccinated and take the medication. The only prevention method we currently have is to attempt to control the level of mosquitoes. Another protozoan disease is called leishmaniasis. Some people pronounce this leishmania. And that has to do with the effect that the protozoan can have on the brain, causes people to have kind of a manic effect. Whenever you immediately get bit by the vector, the sand fly, it puts the plasmodium in, excuse me, the leishmania protozoan into your bloodstream. You get a really nasty lesion at the site of infection. The lesion will eventually go away and you have some worse side effects. 
We have one helminth disease of the cardiovascular and lymphatic system called schistosomiasis. This is caused by a blood fluke. In order to get the blood fluke, all you have to do is swim in infected water. Whenever a human has a blood fluke, the feces of that infected human ultimately ends up in the water supply. The fluke will then penetrate the skin of another human, move through the body by way of the cardiovascular system, affecting every organ in the body. The typical initial sign is going to be an extremely swollen abdomen from all of the organs being irritated. This schistosoma is also known to affect male urethras, leading to urethral bleeding, which is a pretty unique side effect of any infection.